12. You're already into, into the evening. Hello, welcome to the question and answer period number two. I'm Darlene from Herbie Photography. And we have a few people joining us from a few places today. And we're just going to see if we can answer some questions. So let's start with um, who's on my right on the bottom there. And just introduce yourself. Tell me where you're from, uh, what you do during the day if you're not a full-time photographer, which I'm assuming most of you are not. And um, maybe just a little bit about your experience in photography. So let's start with Eugene. OK. Uh, my name is Eugene. <coughs> um, my day job is a small animal veterinarian. I am outside of Chicago, Illinois in the United States. Um, as far as photography goes, I learned on film kind of on and off in high school. Uh, slide, black and white film. Then school got in the way for a good nine years. And then finally took it up after graduation. Uh, still was using film and slide until digital came into play and have been shooting digital ever since, I, although I still have my Nikon F100 in the closet somewhere. Um, what do I shoot mostly? I'll try anything. Uh, what am I most comfortable with? Uh, candids, uh, abstract, some portrait, but I'll shoot anything to get out of my comfort zone and try to learn a little bit more and see what I can do. Cool. Uh, okay. Um, we're going to try and get some information from Linda, um, if, you, if you can get her to type in and we'll read it as we go, but uh, you go next, Quincy, and we'll wait for Linda to type something in. Can we, we can't hear you, Quincy. You might be, are you muted? I was because I there typed loudly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so my name is Quincy and I'm from Edmonton. I am just uh, in the same city as Darlene. We're not far from one another. We've never met until last night. Uh, I am a photographer. I'm not making a living doing it, but I'm not doing anything else. <laughs> um, so I just uh, really just live and breathe photography and I'm going to try and make some money at it. That's my goal this year. Cool. Okay, and Linda has typed. She's from Vegreville, Alberta, which is east of Edmonton, uh, southeast of Edmonton. My husband and I have Olson Art Creative Photography, and she's joined me on a couple of photo walks in Edmonton that I've led, and she says, very fun. They enjoy all types of photography and are fairly new to it with no formal training. All right. Uh, Ralph. Hi, hi, darling. Can I just first of all say thank you for uh, for this? Anyway, so uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm Ralph. I'm from the United Kingdom. Um, I'm about ninety miles east east of Manchester. Um, I'm not a full time photographer, um, but I'm just recently retired, and I intend to become a full time photographer. Um, I've been mainly sort of into film. Uh, went digital about ten years ago. Um, I've taken lots of portraits, uh, family groups, I've never been into weddings, um, but now I've retired, I would really, really like to go and do landscape and, uh, and wildlife. Um, um, and I'm struggling a little bit with that, so uh, anyway, nice to see you all, and thank you again, darling. Awesome, thanks for joining. So we've got a neat diverse group here. Looks like a couple of you want to sort of do do it as a living. And I know oh, we lost Linda. I know Linda and, and her husband do some portraits and things. So they are, are making some of their income from photography. Hopefully she'll join us again. So let's start with Eugene. And we'll just go through. And let's maybe do um, one question from each. And we'll just sort of rotate. Because I was trying to do maybe you know five or ten minutes each. So we'll try a different method today, and let's go one question each and <coughs> go around and circle that way. So you're up, Eugene. OK. Um, as far as uh, right now, it's kind of in a, in a rut as far as um, what, to sh what to shoot. Um, do you have any, like, a creative exercise or two or even three that could kind of uh, <laughs> Give you give give me a creative kick in the pants, so to speak. Let's put it that way. 
Okay. Well, my first question would be is, did you sign up on my website and download the, the e-book that I have, which is 10 Challenges to Improve Your Photography? I just signed up on your website a couple days ago. I think I, I, I have... I have downloaded it, but I haven't had a chance to look at it yet just, just because of the work schedule that's, that I've had. Okay, so the title would indicate that there's actually 10 things in there that are going to get you thinking. Okay, So everything in there is, is pretty much an exercise or a challenge to, to do exactly that. Um, one of my favorite ones in there, as you read through them, is to lock yourself in the bathroom and don't come out till you have 100 pictures. Huh, okay. <laughs> My wife might have an issue with that, but I guess I can give that a try. <laughs> well, maybe you could lock yourself in your neighbor's bathroom for something <laughs> different. You know? It could be it could be the garage, it could be the basement, it could be any room. But the idea is that you force yourself to come up with something outside the box, right? So when you're in a confined space like that, that you think, oh, there's nothing in here to photograph, and you can't come out till you have a hundred, it forces you to start looking at things a little differently, right? Okay. Okay. Right? So that's one of the exercises in, in the book. Um, another one that I talk about a lot, and I mentioned this in my classes too, is to actually just go and look at art. So go spend some time at some art galleries, whether it be local art galleries with you know local artists or the big galleries, you know, like go to the big Chicago gallery. Um, we actually hit Chicago um, when we were on a six-month RV trip, and we uh, we hit the free day at the museum. So we went and we we spent the afternoon there. It was really great. So mm -hmm. you've got you've got a great art gallery museum there. Go spend some time and look at all different kinds of art. So not just photography, paintings and sculptures, and you know even stuff like that you don't understand, right? Just to get an idea of what are people doing in the art world, and it, it might spur some creativity for you. Okay. All right, so there's a couple things to get you started. All right, let's go Quincy. Okay. Um, well, I wasn't really sure what I was going to ask you today. I thought I was going to listen a little bit more, and but that's okay. Um, you talked just recently about writing a book. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have actually gone towards e-books, you know, whether they're selling them for $2, $5, it's got to be adding up. Um, have you written books like that, or? Well, the the one that I just talked about for Eugene is a. It's actually an ebook that I wrote, and it, it is a PDF form, so it's downloadable on my site, and it's it's basically a free giveaway for people that subscribe as a reader to my site. Okay, and I am working on a couple of other ones that will be paid ebooks, so they'll be more specific. Like I'm working on one on photographing people when you travel. So like travel photography but specific to people. And I'm working on another one um, with images from my RV trip. We traveled 17,000 miles and I took 17,000 pictures. And it was kind of a journey of rediscovery for myself. So I talk a lot in there about exercises and things that sort of got me back into um, back into the passion of fur photography because I'd been a little burned out in the industry and, and I see that happen with a lot of photographers where they go through cycles of, okay, I'm burnt out, I'm going to quit this, right? Because the, the photography business, the business is, is quite tough, right? And if you don't do something for yourself, I really am a big advocate of personal projects, even if you're doing the, the business of photography, still do something for you, right? Um, so yeah, I am working on on ebooks as well. What kind of program do you use for that? To to write it or design it or sure. Uh, so. I'm on a Mac, and the one that I did, I used Pages, which is a Mac program you can get for about twenty bucks. But I'm probably going to hire a designer to do these other ones up nice. I did download it uh, the other day, but kind of as Eugene said, I just haven't got to it yet. But I have downloaded it, and I'm intrigued already about the bathroom idea. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Make sure you clean first, right? I'm going to. <laughs> well, sometimes if it's not so clean, you might get more interesting pictures. I don't know. Well, and if you're in there for long enough, it'll be clean by the time you come out, right? Yeah, do <laughs> cool. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, let's go to Ralph. Hi, darling. Yeah. Um, Say, so I've been um, taking um, photographs, uh, portraits um, for a photography company for some years, so I'm really happy in a studio. Um, I've treated myself to just a, 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 a Canon um, 
camera. It's it's only a 600D. Um, I'm I'm really changing tact. Really, I'm I'm sort of into wildlife and nature landscapes. Um, it's always been my passion. I thought when I retired that you know that's what I would do. Um, I really can't afford a super super telephoto zoom lens and what have you. Um, we have some lakes near us, and there's lots of wildlife down there, all different types of birds and what have you. And I found that I'm shooting sort of um, uh, wildlife from about 50 to 100 yards. Um, but I'm struggling with focus, darling. Really, really mm -hmm. am. Of course, a lot of these birds and, uh, are in flight, and of course, the focus continually changes. And I, where I think, um, yeah, I focus right. And of course, a bird never goes where you want it to go. And sometimes they come straight at you. And of course, they're getting nearer or they're flying away. So I'm really struggling with focus. Um, okay. I've been experimenting with the different settings, obviously. But you put a baby or a mother and baby in front of me and I'll shoot that. That's great. But <laughs> put a bird in front of me and I'm struggling big time. time. Okay, so a couple things. Um, unfortunately, the, the wildlife shooters, um, it's not my specialty, but the fellow that I work with here in Edmonton, he has a Burwell School of Photography. He has some great wildlife stuff, and he is a wildlife shooter, and he, um, he writes for Outdoor Photography Canada magazine about his work. Unfortunately, they all do have the big lenses, right? <laughs> Most yeah. of the most of the wildlife shooters are are using big lenses. We're talking, you know, four, five, six hundred millimeter, right? Yeah. And as and as fast as possible. So they're investing in, you know, ten thousand dollar pieces of glass, right? Yeah. Um, one thing that you might be able to do, like how far you said you're ninety miles from from Manchester, or how far are you from like London or Liverpool or like? A yeah, city? yeah, yeah. London is um, is is sort of two hundred miles south, but I'm on the coast here. I'm sort of twenty minutes from the coast over over here in East England. So okay. you know, I've got plenty around me. Um, I've got the I don't know if you've heard the North Yorkshire National Park and and what have you. So um, lots and lots of opportunities. And, well, what uh, I'm thinking about in terms of being close to a big center is can you rent equipment? Is there somewhere where you can rent oh, yeah. such a lens? Yeah, I think I'm. I think I will buy a lens, but obviously it's sort of um, I'm dipping my feet in the water, so to speak, at the moment. So uh, just seeing how I get on. Okay. If I, ha if I have to, I will go back to you know making some money shooting portraits. But you know now I've retired, you see, and I've got more time. It's nice to get out into the country and. Um, it, it's a change for me, so, uh, you know, massive change for me. Fresh air and instead of being stuck in a studio. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Now, in terms of your focus thing, um, have you ever tried the back button focus, and do you know what I mean by that? Yes, I do. Yes, yes. Okay. You yes. use that quite regularly? Because that's what I would suggest for, for birds in particular, right? Because yeah. um, a friend of mine, she's a sports photographer and has been a sports photographer with a newspaper for years. She's now sort of retired and she's you know raising her kids mm -hmm. but that's what she recommends and she teaches a sports photography class and it's kind of the same principle you know anytime you have a fast moving object so for those of you that aren't familiar with that please grab my camera on a Canon you can set up your camera normally you focus when you press your shutter button halfway down and what I'm talking about is you can set up your camera to focus with one of these on the back Okay, so when I push here, that's when my lens focuses, not when I push here. And so I operate with two fingers. So I focus with my thumb, and then I press the shutter when I when I feel the, the picture is right. So you can actually hold this button down the whole time, and it will continue focusing as long as you have your camera set on that continuous focus mode. So I'm assuming you've got that set as well, right, Ralph? Yes, yes. It works, you know, um, I, I'm taking, um, this last few days, I'm taking sort of anywhere between 40 and 200 shots, and I may be getting, I don't know, um, on a good day, may, maybe 10 decent shots in focus. I know I know um, it, it's difficult, and it's practice and practice, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep doing that, but, uh, but yeah, thank you, thank you. So what lens do you have? Um, I've just got a 300 mil, that's all. And how fast, how fast is it? Oh, you tell me. <coughs> What's the maximum sure. aperture? 4.5. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's fairly decent then. Yeah. Um, when I say how fast is a lens, what that means is the what is the biggest opening in the aperture? 
Right? That's yeah, what that, that's four five, yeah. Yeah. So the the slower lenses, like if you get like into the Tamrons or the Sigma, sometimes you get ones that when they, you know, the zoom lenses that go to three hundred, some of them mm. are at five six or even six point three, and because the the opening is is not letting in enough light, that can hinder focus as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, you may find. Can okay, I? You said that your camera is a six hundred D. I think we have different models here in the U S. and Canada. Um, what is that yeah. going to equate to? Do you know in terms of? Um, is it the T three? Okay. So is it a Rebel series? <laughs> Sorry. Is it a Rebel series? Does it say Rebel? Yes. Okay. Yes. So you may also find that upgrading to a body that has um, faster Both capabilities range. will help too. Like in, I don't know what the what the UK model numbers are, but say something like 70, a 7D, yeah, yeah, 7D. 7D. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it'll also have a faster burst rate, so you can shoot more frames per second, mm. right? Generally, the only difference between sort of the entry-level cameras and what they call the pro cameras and the ones in between um, our durability of the body, like this is the 5D Mark III, and it's it's a metal alloy body with plastic over it, whereas yeah. like say the Rebels and so on are more plastic, so yes. you're going to have, you have to be sort of more delicate in the field, right? Like I can bang this sucker around and my other one actually has, my old one actually has a dent in it, right? Um, <laughs> the other thing is the motor drive, right? How fast can it shoot? How many frames per second? Yeah. And full frame, this one is full frame. But the 7D versus, say, a Rebel, the, the sensors are actually very similar. And some of the newer Rebels, like the T4i, actually probably has a better sensor than the 7D because it's newer, right? Mm -hmm. But where your difference is, is in your, your fast shooting, um, it probably will focus a little faster for you and the, um, the, the durability. Right? Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask you a question, Ralph? Yeah. yeah. Please do. When you say that you shoot about forty shots and you come away with ten good ones, are you talking about birds? No, I'm. I'd, I'd probably come away with ten decent ones if you know. If I can, it depends. It um, today I took over two hundred photos, and uh, I think I'm going to get about ten decent ones. Yesterday I took forty, but only got two. But they were absolutely superb. <laughs> um, but the rest were just, you know. When are I zoomed, you using a tripod? No, no, I'm I'm in manual mode. And, and without uh, a tripod, just... pretty tough without a bird. Yeah. You might try a monopod, Ralph, because when you get up into those big lenses, like yeah. if you get into a longer lens than that, um, yeah. because your your 300 on your Rebel is actually a 450, right? Because of the lens factor. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite a long lens. You might try a monopod if you have. I've yeah. got a real good. Uh... Yeah, can you see? Manfrotto, yeah. I, I treated myself to one, and uh, yeah, yeah, it, it does help, I must admit, yeah. Because it will steady you at least this way, right? Yes. Um, if anybody wants to share their images, like if you want to show us something, on the left-hand side where the chat button is, right below it, there's a screen share button, and you can hit screen share and then choose desktop, and then you can you can switch over and show us photos in another application, if you like. But I was going to comment, like you said, you took 200 photos and you took, you got maybe, you know, 10 good ones and, and two outstanding. Yeah. Honestly, that's about the ratio that most pros will expect. Yeah, 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 thank right. you. So, and I find that when people are just beginning, I mean, you're not in the beginner stage, but beginners especially get discouraged because they take so many and then they're not getting so many keepers, right? Mm. But honestly, it's part of the process, you know, like you have to kind of evolve the shot into, okay, where's the best place to stand? You know, can you get closer in your case to the birds without them flying away and that sort of thing. So your shot may may take a hundred to evolve to get even to the spot you want to be in, yeah. right? I've been, I've been spoilt in the studio because obviously it's, you know how far your subject's going to be away from you so you can do a lot beforehand. You've got a bird flying at you at 30, 40 miles an hour or across your vision and or suddenly one will appear from nowhere. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you. You've given me a lot of time. Thank you. All right. Um, does Linda have any questions she wants to ask? Maybe just type that in for her, Quincy. She can actually hear us now. Oh, good. Uh, so she is typing down there. So there's a couple things she said to you there as well, Ralph, but she can hear us. She'll have to type back. Okay, so she's uh, Eugene says back button focus will set you free. Nice. <laughs> <It will. laughs> uh, and Linda's grabbing her camera. Okay, 
she's on an entry level rebel as well. She says and wants to upgrade. Looks like okay, so. Looks like there's something there she typed in about nighttime photography. Okay, what is my recommended setting for nighttime without using a strobe and such? Okay, a couple things for nighttime. Obviously, number one, you're going to need a tripod. That's kind of a given. Okay. Um, the things that I recommend in my night class are number one, start with the low ISO. So ISO 100 or 200 if you're on Nikon, if that's your lowest. Because what happens in when you're shooting at night is people think, okay, I got to turn up the ISO to because it's dark. But when you're on a tripod, you can expose, you know, forever, right? So don't worry about the length of the exposure. Go with the low ISO because it's going to keep your noise down to a minimum. Um, noise lives in what's called the blue channel. Like, have you all heard the RGB, right? Just red, green, blue. Okay, so those are your color layers in your picture, and blue is where noise tends to to reside. And at night, what is the color we see the most of? There's a lot of blue, right? So number one, low ISO, okay. Number two, make sure you have a cable release or some type of a remote so that you're not touching the camera when you press the button. Okay, that'll eliminate some of your camera shake. Right? Um, I just have a simple one. I don't have it here. Maybe I can grab it. Um, I just have a simple one that plugs into the camera and it has a little button and a slide. So when I put it on bulb, it locks and then I can time my, my shot for longer than what my camera will have. Because your camera will only go up to 30 seconds in time for you and beyond that, you know, then you're, you're, I use my phone, right? So I just use my iPhone as my timer. You can, um, there's actually an app as well. I just found out about it that you can get your phone to trigger your camera. You, um, you have to buy a cord for it. I think it's about $50. And you can get the program that goes on your phone to trigger the, the camera and time it. So if you're doing uh, a minute or two minute exposures, it'll actually time it and shut the, the camera on and off for you. Is that, the, that, trigger, is that the trigger trap? Um, that's another one. Um, I'll see if I can find it. It was iOS something. iOS Shutter, I think, is it's okay. called. Okay, because there's a bunch of them out there. That... Yeah. Yeah, iOS Shutter is the one that I just heard about. But, yeah, there's a few different ones. Um, you can also get pretty fancy ones that do, like, interval times and stuff like that, too. Right. But the biggest thing is low ISO and use your, use your cable release. Okay, so let's see what she's saying here. She says, I will share my idea for tonight. I'll use tripod set up at the intersection, take a photo with remote during the green light, then for yellow light and a red light, and make a type of layered finished photo with all the traffic lights on at the same time. Any specific tips on the shooting, not the editing? Um, I have a tip for both, actually, Linda. When you're, you're shooting, you're right. You do have to kind of time it if you're doing traffic. You want to time it so that you get, you know, the traffic. So you have to decide, do you want to see the cars or do you want them to disappear and just have the light streaks, okay? If you want to just have light streaks, make sure that your exposures are actually quite long. So you want to have, say, 15 or 30 seconds because then what will happen is the cars will come through the scene, the lights will show up, but the cars won't, okay? They'll be ghosts. Okay? If you want to see the cars, then, then do a shorter one. For editing, um, I haven't tried this program yet, but there's a program called Star Tracks, T R A X. I'll type it in here, uh, Star Tracks. And one of my students used it to do um, star trails. The idea is that when you're out at night and you're shooting star trails, rather than doing, say, a 45 minute exposure to get the stars arching across the sky, your camera gets really hot when it's on for that long and you get exposure problems, so you do a series of small ones and then stitch them together. And that's what Star Trek does, is you, you, you throw them into this program and it basically stitches them all together. It looks for stuff and it fills in the gaps even between them, okay? So you can even use that for your traffic. He did it on a couple of traffic shots, threw them in there, and literally 30 seconds he had merged them all together. And I think it's a free program, I'm pretty sure. Even better. Oh, are you good, Linda? She says, thanks so much. Yes, cool. Okay, Quincy. I'd love to see somebody's images. Okay, share, I can share some. some. Yeah. I'll try something just because I haven't tried the screen share feature yet. Go so, for it. 
Let me just find something here. I was looking up that Star Trek program when you said that. Uh, so one of the things Darlene talked about was a project. And I do a one-a-day project. Cool. Now, I don't necessarily shoot a photo a day because being in Canada, we have to enjoy the time we have when it's nice out. So I edit over the winter, which is, and shoot over the summer. Um, so I'm just going to try this screen share and see where we get to, because then I don't know what's going to happen. But we'll try it. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So can you guys see that? Okay. Yes. Okay, because now I can't see any of you. So, <laughs> um, so this is a picture that I posted for today. Uh, this is down at Abraham Lake. Let's see if I can make it a bit bigger. Um, I'm in a camera club here and a lot of people from the camera club are heading out to Abraham Lake this weekend so I thought I'd share this, give them some encouragement. It's about minus 33 when I shot that. Another project that I do in addition to my one a day project is Jasper in January. It's my pet project. Very dear to my heart. And this was, for, so for the month of January, I showed images of Jasper in January over the last five years that I've been doing this project. So this was the, the last one from 31st, and it's, of course, on your way out of Jasper National Park. I'll just flip through a couple of them just so you can see kind of what I do here. That's very pretty. Thank you. I did a series on a place called the Glory Hole. And it's known for having great shots all of the time. So these are, this is another shot from the glory hole. I shot four different years because every year it is so different from one to the next. So the other day I just showed all these different images, again, from the glory hole. So let me ask you, um, how far from, say, the highway or the road are some of these these locations? Like, are you hiking into backcountry, or are these... No, not at all. Like, these glory hole shots, I mean, we're parked uh, just up the hill. I don't know if there's a shot that can... This one, actually, uh, I had to clone out the piece that I was standing on top of right here, which is the uh, culvert going through the creek. So the truck was not far. I mean, I'm talking maybe 20 feet. And this is just a spectacular place to shoot. So uh, someone from Ontario told me that we're blessed to have the curbs that we do. <laughs> because we can actually park there and, you know, and get off. I know when I watch some of the uh, stuff, uh, you know, in the States on interstate highways, there's no way you want to be parked there. But, yeah, so this is kind of, you know, what I do. And I do have a one-a-day project going. Uh, it keeps me editing and it keeps me getting images, uh, even if they're just coming off my hard drive. They're not doing me any good sitting there. So, yeah, that's kind of what I do. Uh, I'm also a bit of a birder, and I'm only going to just touch on that real quick because you were talking about uh, shooting birds, Ralph. Yeah. So I do a lot of camping, uh, and we found a really great spot that has a lot of birds. Yeah. So... We like to get out there and shoot the birds and feed the birds. The biggest lens that I have only goes up to 300. You can get a good image of a bird that's sharp with that lens. Uh, you might have to turn up the ISO in order to get the shutter speed fast enough that you can catch them. That one's not very sharp, but it's a cute picture. It is cute. Uh, Linda says... Quincy, are most of these multiple exposures, the finished photos are beautiful, landscapes, bird photos are beautiful as well, but I would assume single exposure, of course, on the birds. But she wants to know, are they multiple exposures on your landscapes? None of them are. Can you see me again? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I. none of them are multiple exposures. I have bought some HDR software that I have never used. I've been shooting for HDR for five years and never tried it. So none of those are multiple exposures. I use a lot of glass filters and then post-processing. Okay. 
Um, I noticed that a lot of your pictures, you're kind of shooting on the on the edge of the light. Like there's some, you know, some sunset, dusk pictures, and it looks like some early morning stuff. Do you tend to stick to those times of day? Well, no, I don't. A lot of people say that you, you know, can't get good images in midday, and I seem to still get good images in the heat of a summer day. Um, so no, I'm not. Uh, real picky on that. Uh, sometimes mornings come real early, but it is the best light. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I'm not a huge morning person either, but uh, when I, I did a workshop in Drumheller last fall and we got up at 5 a.m. and went out for 6 a.m. to shoot the sunrise and it turned out it was spectacular, so it worked out really good for us. I think that's why I love winter photography, because the sunrise isn't until Later. late 30. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to Eugene. Have you got some other questions for me? Or would you um, like to share any pictures? Well, let me see if this works. Uh, full screen. I'll do the photo viewer. Let's see if that works. I find that sometimes, you know, not necessarily me giving a critique or anything, but just getting in a like hangouts are really great. You know, you don't have to do it do it with somebody who's a teacher. Just get in a pop in a hangout, join some photography communities, and and hang out like this with other photographers and share images and just banter like this. It's great. It's good value. Is there a, is there a picture on the screen at all? We see a black and white. Okay. Um, this is. I don't know if you remember. I don't know how 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 um, recent you're in Chicago, Darlene. But this Sabine. is. Yep. Yeah. Very good. She remembers it. And for those of you who don't know what the Bean is, it's called Cloud. Officially, it's called Cloudgate, but they call it the Bean locally. And it's this big, polished, stainless steel kidney bean um, sculpture that has reflections everywhere. So photography buffs come out everywhere, from everywhere, and just take pictures left and right. And so this is one of part of the Chicago skyline where I incorporated the bean and tried to get a little bit of a bending perspective on half of the skyline. Um, it took me about, you were saying, um, that it took you, you took 100 shots to get maybe a couple. This took me about 50 or 60 with a tripod uh, to figure out the shot. And you know when you find it, but it takes you. It took me a while to get this shot as well. So I know where you're coming from. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it, it is actually a hard thing to photograph. Like, uh, I was at the Bean, and I took several, and I'm not sure that I was happy with any of mine, to be honest. Oh, no. I mean, it, it takes it takes you a while. I mean, you take a shot, and you're like, oh, this, this one will look good, but then you put it on your computer, and you're like, oh, gosh, wh what was I thinking here? Or this didn't turn out right, or the, all of a sudden the clouds came, and the light didn't give you the right look that you wanted. So, I mean, for me, luckily, I'm local, so I can come back and... And do it, but I mean, if you're if you're traveling, you have one shot to do it, and hopefully you get it right the first time. But um, let me see. There's an well, that one. Eh, they didn't. I guess they didn't clean it that morning. Usually, there's a guy out there with a power sprayer and water trying to get the shine on it, and just didn't quite get it clean over there. Uh, what else have I got here? This was at a this was at a firehouse in Chinatown, I believe, if I'm if I remember, and they were. Firefighters were all were nice enough to put stuff out for us to shoot, and we just, I guess it was uh, your bathroom idea, Darlene, back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, we mm -hmm. had the firehouse this time, so <laughs> we were able to shoot some stuff. No, not that one. Not that one. That's my son. And then this, this was, I was lucky enough to be with Brian Peterson, who, um, who, who actually lives in Chicago. No, oh, we're losing your audio. Chicago now, and he. Uh, what's that? We lost your audio for a second there. At least am, I did. Am I, am I back? Yeah. Okay. And uh, he took us on a three-day workshop in Chicago, and he took us down an alley. And you know, we're coming down an alley, and we're just like, "What the heck are we gonna shoot in here?" And then he just started showing us, "Why don't you do this? This is what we're gonna do." Blah 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 blah, and prepare it for HDR. I'm like, "Okay, we'll 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 give it a try." And I went home, and this was the HDR shot that I came up with. So sometimes you just go, you just have to go, like Darlene said, think out of the box and just 
wow, an alley. And all of a sudden you see reflection, you see where the light's going, you're like, you know what? He, he knows what he's talking about. And now I, I, now I try to go into alleys or try to look at some other things. And it's funny because people look at you and they're like, what are you taking a picture of? <laughs> and so this, this is the result. So these are a couple of the photos that I got. And like I said, I'll try anything. And I'll try to get out of my comfort zone and just see how far I can push it. Um, you make a good point. Like you said, you got out with this Brian Peterson. I know his name sounds familiar. I'm sure I've seen his Understanding work. Understanding exposure. Yeah, I'm sure I've seen his work. Mm -hmm. But Linda mentioned that she joined me on some photo walks, and I'm I'm also a big advocate of of joining a photo club or a photo walk or something. Um, another group that I'm involved in is is called Drink and Click. And it's a guy in, um, I believe he's in Phoenix that started it. His name is Juan. But there's branches in several cities now. I'm sure there's probably one in, in your area, Eugene. Okay. Um, we're doing one here in Edmonton for, for you girls. Uh, Ralph, I don't know if there's one in the UK, but you can have a look. And if there isn't one, you can actually apply to start your own. Um, basically what it is, is it's, it's exactly what it sounds like. You get together to go and do some photography and then have a couple of drinks and then maybe go do some more photography and you know have another drink. Um, and they're not advocating you know drinking by any sort of stretch of the means, but it could be coffee or hot chocolate. Like our first walk we did in September, it was minus you know 15 Celsius, which is a little brisk. And um, we, we, did, we opted for the hot chocolate in the middle and then we opted for the uh, the, the glass of wine or the beer at the end of the walk kind of thing for the diehards. So it's just a chance to get out and do exactly what you said, go out with other people that enjoy photography and maybe photograph something that you wouldn't have thought of, of photographing. Oh, the picture should be interesting after a couple rounds. <laughs> exactly. So if you, um, I'll, I'll see if I can find the link for you guys on Google Plus and I'll, I'll, um, I'll send I'll send you a link on um, on Google Plus to the the main Drink and Click page. There's a community uh, you can join. So, are, is everybody familiar with, with communities? How many of you have been on Google Plus for a while? No, I'm just I'm, starting. Yeah, I've been I've been on it for a couple months, and I've seen I've seen some of the communities that are on there. Okay, so for those of you that are just new to Google Plus, communities are kind of like groups on Facebook if you're a Facebook person. Okay, so here's I'll send it in the chat room. There's the um, community for the drink and click. Now that's the main community for for sort of all of the groups and you can see there's an event listing part way down and he kind of puts all of the different cities events in there. So even if you're traveling you could even pick up an event somewhere else too. Um, another place you can pick up stuff is, is Flickr or Meetup and join up stuff there, uh, camera clubs. But just get out and shoot with some other people because I, I love to see what everybody else shoots when we get out on these things. Like Linda had some great macros when we did our, our walk in the summer. Um, she had some really cool close-ups. I wonder if she can do screen share. Can you do screen share, Linda? Um, so I, just clicked says, on, I just clicked onto her link. She's got some really nice shots. Yeah, she does, absolutely. Um, so she says, I encourage everybody to join a photo group. Don't worry about what level you're at. There are great people like Darlene, thanks, who welcome anyone. <laughs> Let's make her blush. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> her photos are at home, so she can't share anything with us. So, um, Awesome. Uh, do you have her photos there on the screen, Eugene? Maybe you can screen share some of her pictures for us. Okay, let's see if let's see if this works out. The way <laughs> am, am I pink? <laughs> the way technology's been going today, who knows? Well, you did good the first time. Yeah, I see something. There they are. I oh, love that's this mine. one. I love this one. Well, those are Quincy's. Oh, that's mine. Is this yours? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's sorry. okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one though. <laughs> Sorry, Linda. I didn't mean to attribute to the wrong person. That's okay. I'll I got I'll find hers for you. Okay. Let's see. Okay, there's Linda. And I know she's got some amazing flower shots in here. Oh, here's her photo walk ones. This is from the one we did in I think it was July. I can get it to load. Okay, let's find Linda. 
this. Wow. So these are, these are just some from the uh, from from the walk that we did. Those are some of mine. There is, there is Linda, and there's her other half. So she's doing, you can see the really close-up she's doing here, and I'll, I'll see if I can find you the result of what she shot. Okay, so she's really in tight on this. Can you guys see this little lion sculpture thing? Mm -hmm. And yep. she's really, really in tight. Like she's like half an inch away from this thing. Right. That's mine. It seems to load slower when I'm online or something here with the hangout slows everything down, hey? Soren's, that's her other half. I really like this one of his on the bench here, with this little berry. So looking for for things unusual, right? You know, everybody else is shooting the river valley and this this vast expanse, and he's shooting a berry on a on a bench, right? Any other questions while I'm looking for Linda's pictures here? There we go, there's some of hers. Okay, let's see if we can make Linda blush now. <laughs> <laughs> so good eye to see something like that, right? A cigarette butt in between the shadows there. Now you guys don't have Timmy's in the UK. Do you have Timmy's down there, Eugene? Mm, no, not yet. <laughs> Tim Hortons is like our our coffee of choice up here. Gotcha. It's not really like Starbucks, it's more like Dunkin' Donuts or something like that. Dunkin' Donuts, they're, okay. Yeah, they're they're uh, coffee and donuts, and they have you know soup and sandwich kind of thing. But Timmy's makes good coffee and. We joke about that they put, you know, crack in it or something because you gotta have your, gotta have your timmies. Yeah, mm -hmm. nicotine. Is it actually proven that they have put it in? Yes, but whether or not that's true, I don't know. Right. Like low it's camera a crazy angle. Canadian thing. Yeah, low camera angle, right? I love, I love this. Are you guys seeing these? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So this is just all from photo walk. Another interesting angle, right? And we're walking along the River Valley in Edmonton, which is very scenic. We're at, you know, I, I chose to do it at dusk so we can get the sunset. And so there's the River Valley, right? We do have quite a picturesque River Valley. I'm trying to find that one on the lion that she took. Like, I love that. It looks like you're in the country, not in the middle of the city, right? And her macros. I love I love that. Yeah, I'm not finding the lion here. Oh, there he is. Okay. Let's see how close up she's getting. That's a serious close up. That little Florida de lis thing there is maybe an inch across. That's how macro that is. There we go. Um, anything you want to share with us, Ralph? Do you want to show any images? Um, I'm just typing, darling. Actually, I really have to go. I am so sorry. You got to go cook dinner, don't you? I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my wife and son will be home very soon. Can may, may I just say thank you? Yes. Awesome having you. Yeah, it'd be great to uh, it'd be great to um, see 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 you all again anyway sometime. 
Yeah, well, like I said, um, this, this is something I may do again on a regular basis, so just um, keep an eye out for it. And you see my yeah. son's just walked through the door. Yeah, he, he and he's going through. to be hungry, right? <laughs> uh, thank you for all the photography tips, though. It's really, really helped. Thank you. Yeah, and keep in touch. Like, you know, like I said, if you're new to Google+, Plus. Yeah, Stay, two, two days. Go through the community. There's a couple of articles on my site because I'm a big believer in Google+. Plus. Um, the f thing that I find different between some of the other communities, like you can join Flickr, and I know there's a whole bunch of stuff on yeah. there. Uh, yeah. I kind of got bored with Flickr myself because I found there was too much what I call mm. noise. You know, yeah. everybody comments and gives all these awards, and you post a picture and everybody goes, ooh, ah, but you really don't learn anything, in my opinion. Um, yeah. I find that Google Plus is really interactive. I love the Hangouts. You know, like if I'm processing, sometimes I'll just open up a Hangout and say, "Hey, who wants to chat?" and yeah. open it up to my photography circle, and I'll yeah. have a couple of other people pop in, and you know, we'll share our screen and say, "Hey, what are you working on? Let's see, what are you working on?" and just 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 shoot the breeze while we're working on stuff. So it's a right. great way to just really get involved in in photography. Thank you very much, and uh, nice if you all want to keep in touch, please do. Love the photography, some great shots there. Thank you. All have right, a good evening, Ralph. Nice. Yeah, bye, Eugene. Bye, Linda. Bye, Quincy. Thank you, darling. Take care. Good night. Thanks. Bye bye. Good night. Okay, and then Linda says that Soren is eavesdropping, <laughs> and he's, <laughs> um, he's been listening and trying the back bucket button focus on his Canon. Um, so that he can show her afterwards. Um, yeah, if you can't find how to set it, check your manual, and it does take a little bit of practice because you want to make sure two things. You want to make sure that when you are using the back button that it doesn't focus here anymore. So when you press the shutter, it doesn't focus, right? And I use I use that almost all the time, and especially if you're doing portraits. I actually prefer that. Like I know you guys do portraits. So that when I set up my people, I focus, and then every time I take the, the picture, it's not refocusing. So there's no chance of me, you know, focusing on the tree behind them or getting getting it wrong. You know, like if your little focus dot hits in between two people, now you're going to have a really nice crisp, crisp background, right? So I use the back button on my portraits all the time. Yesterday you said that you uh, use your shutter for your HDR, HDR photos? Yep. yep. So would you have it on that same focus or would you have it on manual focus because you wouldn't want it to autofocus differently than it had in the first shot? Right, yeah, I use it on back button for that too. So when I'm doing HDR, when I'm on tripod, when I'm doing night photography, so that's another thing for night photography, Linda, is you want to make sure that you're not focusing with that front button because um, it's not so bad if you're shooting street lights or something because it's going to find something to focus on. But if you're shooting at night and you're trying to do star trails or something like that, your camera's just going to keep doing that, you know, in and out, in and out, because it's not going to find anything. So either do what Quincy was saying is turn it to manual and manual focus, or you can use the back button focus. So once you find something to focus on, um, focus, and then once you let go, it's locked until you press that button again. So that's what I do for my HDRs as well, Quincy. Oh, and she says, Linda says, oh my goodness, I focus on trees behind people often. So this will be a, a good thing to try, right? <laughs> there you go. Worth the price of admission, right? Anything else anybody wants to share? We're coming up on, on noon here where we are. <coughs> I'm going to be shooting some silhouettes this afternoon. Do you have any tips for that? Silhouettes. Like I'm just going to be okay. doing them in the in the apartment, but uh, I find what I'm trying to do is I'm backlighting them, and I really would prefer that the item that I'm even if it was a flower vase that it turn black. Okay. But I'm finding that the last time I tried it, I was still getting so much detail in what I was shooting that then I took it into Photoshop and I actually just filled it in in black, which okay. is kind a of cheating. Things. Yeah, silhouettes are actually pretty tough to do in a studio. Number one, if you have white walls, you're going to have problems because the light's going to bounce all over the place and you're going to get some spilling to the front. So if you can work in a dark room... Bathroom. That, yeah, um, but if it's got light walls, it's still going to bounce around, right? right? So if you've got, um, 
studio backdrops or something, like if you have a dark backdrop, like you're going to be using a light backdrop for your silhouette, but put two dark ones on the side so that you kind of make this box, right, so the light isn't going around to the front, right? Okay. And you're not actually backlighting the subjects, you're lighting the background. Okay, so light the background, don't light them. Um, having a good distance between them so that, that the light isn't coming around to the front, right? So have them several feet away from the background, that will help too. Okay. And then try that back button focus because you want to focus on the object, not, you know, somewhere in between, right? Great, thank you. Great, that should help. Silhouettes. We talked about sunsets last night, but I mean, sunsets are great for silhouettes, like silhouetting a, an object against the sun. Um, there's one lady that I know. I'm trying to get her to write an article for me. Hopefully, she's listening. <laughs> She'll do it. She does a lot of beach portraits in the evening, and she silhouettes people on the beach, and they're just stunning. And we don't have such a thing here. I suppose you could go up and do it at the lake, right, Eugene? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. More, more, and more, more sunrise than sunset, though, since. Uh, oh, facing the wrong way. Yep, facing the wrong way. I okay, gotcha. Um, so, what kinds of things do you like to photograph, Eugene? Like we saw, you know, some city shots. But what's your, what's what's your passion? My passion, as far as shooting, you know, if I had to say right now, I've been getting more into the, more into candid portraits, so to speak. I don't know if i call it street, but more... Yeah, I, well, I don't know. More on, the, you know, I'll, I'll just take my camera, go on a walk in the city, and shoot. Um, what I'm finding more often than not, I'm shooting more people in their environment than anything else. So, I mean, as of right now, that's what I've been kind of drawn to. Okay. But like I, like I said before, I mean, I've... I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll dabble in macro, I'll dabble in um, cityscape, I'll dabble in, you know, some nighttime, I'll, I'll dabble in that, so, um, but now, now I'm beginning to focus a little bit more on the candid street. I wouldn't say total street where I'm going, going, because, okay, let me ask you, uh, as far as, like, as for street photography, some people say that, you know, you shouldn't have a really huge lens and a huge camera with you. What do you recommend as far as gear? to, you know, kind of be discreet. Yeah, funny, we talked about this last night, too, in the other hangout. Um, the thing with street photography is you can approach it two different ways. You can approach it with a big lens and, and try and sneak a shot across the street or, you know, the, the spy method, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can actually stick on a 50 or a wide lens and get closer to people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I will do both, like if I'm traveling, but I actually prefer getting closer to people. I would rather them see me taking the photo and have not necessarily an interaction, but almost like just a sort of a mutual, like just a head nod, you know, that, yeah, it's okay if you take my photo, and they know what's happening, and they're okay with it. And I find that you may lose some of the candidness that way, but you also may get into other things that you don't get with the big lens. Like, for example, I mean... Uh, I was in New Orleans and I'm just walking down the street and I come across um, a photo shoot for like a movie. They're shooting a movie. So they've got all these these lights and things set up and they had this, this um, I guess a cherry picker or whatever you call it, where the guy's up in the camera up on this cherry picker shooting through the second floor window and they've got lights and, you know, stuff set up there. And there's these people sitting out on the stoop of this house about two doors down from the set and they're just sitting there having drinks. And it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, right? But everybody drinks in New Orleans at all times yeah. of day. Mm -hmm. And so they clearly were residents. I thought they were part of the movie, and I just started talking to them. And it turns out they, they you know, are living nearby, and they were just getting together watching the goings-on on their street. And the one lady says, it's coming up to sunset. She's like, would you like to come to my apartment? She goes, I have a view down the street, and I look over Bourbon Street out my patio windows. I said, sure, why not? So we walked down the street, and she took me to her place, and sure enough, she opens these double French doors, and out looking this balcony is straight down Bourbon Street into the sunset. It was, it was brilliant. Um, so it's stuff like that you don't get by sneaking the picture, right? True. Very true. Um, I, and, then I, and then it has, you know, a story to tell, right? You have a story. Right. Like um, Another example is I was on a tour in, in Turkey, and... 
I don't usually do tours, but this one was so inexpensive that for I think it was like seventeen hundred dollars I paid for a two week tour, including my flight and all my meals and hotels. So I mean, how could I not, right? Um, and it gave me a really good idea of you know where I'd like to go back and see in Turkey. So we were in this one little town and which is famous for pottery, and of course in these tours they take you to this pottery place and. Um, it was interesting for a while because they were we were outside and the guy had you know those big wheels where you you kick it with your foot and then you mm -hmm. spin the pot and they showed us how to do it and one of our people in our tour got to try it out and and then they bring you they want to bring you inside and it's where their store is right and and they expect you to you know you're there for like an hour and everybody buys stuff right well I didn't want to buy pottery and I don't buy a lot of stuff my souvenirs are my images. So I wandered down the street, which happened to be like a back alley kind of thing, and I ended up meeting this little boy who was about, I want to say about eight, and his sister. And I found out later that at grade two, which is about eight, they take English in school. And so he was really happy to practice his English with somebody. So he starts talking English with me, and he brings out his school books, and he's showing me the, you know, the picture book, and he's reading it to me in English, and he's so proud. And him and his sister are playing soccer, and I'm taking pictures, and um, I'll see if I can find some of the pictures while I'm while I'm doing this here. Um, and and he uh, he was so proud, and then he says he says wait wait a minute, and he goes in the house, and he comes back out with this this coloring book or picture book of things that he's drawn, and he rips a picture out of his book and he gives it to me, and I mean for me that was a way better souvenir than a pot that I could have bought in a place, you know, that means nothing to me, like a, a vase or something. Right. And I, I take little Canadian flags with me um, that I bought at the um, travel store, and I gave them each a little Canadian flag, and I took their photo with the, with the flag. I'm just looking for the pictures here. I have too many. I have 3,000 pictures of Turkey. So while you're looking for that, I'm just going to kind of uh, get Linda's question here to you out because it applies to the same thing. Okay, great. Um, Darlene, are you of the mindset that if people are out in public, they are fair game? Or do you always ask permission first or after? Then she says that you answered it, but I think I might have missed it. Uh, I asked her what her intentions were for the photo. She said just to post on Flickr or 500px. She doesn't intend to sell them. So she usually shoots models or families. Sorry, just lost it. Um, and that's another story. But uh, when it comes to those people in the photo walks, for example, okay. what are your thoughts on posting their pictures? Yeah, I don't have a problem doing it. I mean, in terms of fair game, like if it's for personal use, you don't need a model release. And, and we talked about this last night, too. If, you, if you're just doing it for personal use, you don't need a model release. I think as one human being to another, you want to have permission in terms of you don't want to annoy somebody, right? Or if you're traveling, you want to be sensitive to sort of religious beliefs and if somebody doesn't like their photograph taken because you're stealing their soul or whatever, then just respect that. But um, usually usually I just do it by it, somebody's going to tell me visually with their body language or physically, you know, speak it if they don't want their picture taken. So I'm of the belief of do it until they say not to. Okay. Does that help? Okay, so I found some, some of my turkey pictures here. So this is the pottery place, and there's this neat old guy out here. So I kind of was, there's the pots, of course. So I got something of him, and then how I made my escape was everybody else was going inside, so we're doing this thing here, and they're spinning the, the wheel, right, which was interesting. And at the end of it, um, I just decided, okay, I need to go find the, the washroom. He made that in, like, five minutes. <laughs> and then this is the girl trying it. We, we gave her lots of jokes about how kind of rude-looking her <laughs> thing is. <laughs> We're like, Lisa, that's a little bit, uh, you know, questionable. <laughs> um, so I made my escape to the bathroom. Uh, so now, uh, this is on Facebook the other day. So if you see that, I mean, this is man and woman, but a lot of times it just has these weird symbols. Like sometimes in some countries, like, okay, which one do you go in, right? Uh, so this is just me wandering down the street. 
These are completely unedited, by the way. Like, I haven't done anything to these, so this is just raw footage here. Um, these are actually homes built into the side of hills. This is what the Cappadocia region is, is famous for. So here's this little guy. So I saw him playing. So this is my, my shots from afar, and then I'm still walking and seeing various different things. And I ended up getting to the end of the street, and then I came back, and there he is again. Same kid. So I kept seeing him, and he kept seeing me. Oh, this is a different kid, sorry. I think I HDR this. Okay, so this is the kid that was playing in, in the alley with his sister. So now we're we're talking, and there's the ball she's holding, right? And he wanted to take me into this place across, and he's like, yeah, come in here, come in here, except that that dog was in there. Oh. I'm like, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. He's like, no, no, come on in, come on in. So I just took his picture. Uh, and then little girl, so we're just playing and stuff. I'm trying to find the one with the... So I had to go back to the van. This is their grandmother. So there's them with their little flags that I gave them. And I don't know if I have a picture of the of the painting or the drawing that he gave me. So then there's grandma, and I did some photos. She wasn't sitting in a great place for lighting. I mean, that's the whole, most horrible lighting I could possibly imagine. But I tried to fix it up a little bit in Lightroom. That's the what I came up with. And she was totally fine with me taking her picture. Didn't speak a word of English, but I mean, she saw me doing it and chatting with the kids, and she was having a great time. So that's the kind of interaction that I got instead of a pot, you know. <laughs> oh, here's the drawing. There we go. So that's what this is what he gave me. Ah. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. So that's a drawing of Istanbul, and this town we're in is probably 600 miles from Istanbul, and I don't think he's ever been there, but, you know, we just came from there, and here he is drawing it and giving it to me. I thought it was, that was probably my best moment of the trip. So does that kind of answer your question about photographing people? Yep. A little bit? I've also been given the finger by people. Um, one guy in New Orleans gave me the finger. <laughs> well, yeah, New Orleans, not, not surprising. <laughs> well, most people are, are really, you know, okay with it. And I was photographing the musicians in the square, and I saw this neat old guy across the square, and he was really he had a lot of character, and I was shooting with the, the 300. And, and I, I took a shot of him, and then he puts the finger up. And the funny thing is that my instinct kicked in um, to not upset him, so I put the camera down, and then later on I thought, why didn't I take a picture with the finger? You know? <laughs> yeah. Kicking myself. Okay, so let's read what Linda says here. Um, it's funny, uh, Quincy, that first photo walk we did, many of the street people wanted us to take their photos, even if they didn't get our website or any info. They just wanted to feel important and have me give them some attention. It was quite cute, actually. Yeah, yes, beware of dog, yes. Um, she loves the drawing, very sweet. Right. Yeah, I find that street people, too, that exactly, they, um, they're they very willing to be photographed. I mean, a lot of times, depending on the country you're in, if you're traveling, you know, you'll take somebody's photo and then you get this, right, because they want money. And I, I have no problem giving it if I'm in a really poor country. Like, I'll give them a couple of bucks because, to me, that's my souvenir, so I'll, I'll pay for that over you know, uh, a piece of pottery or something that's just going to sit on my my shelf. My uh, <laughs> I had an ex-boyfriend once that called stuff like that STDs. <laughs> Stuff the dust. Stuff the dust. <laughs> or you can replace the S with a different word in the front, you know. <laughs> really? <laughs> so. Awesome. Any other questions? Does that kind of answer your, your street shooting stuff and people and model releases and all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah, that covers it for me. Um, if you guys are interested, there's another um, thing on a uh, project that uh, somebody else I met on Google Plus started, and it's called Invisible People. And um, I think it's just invisiblepeople.tv, and he, he's doing this series of interviews and photos of, of homeless people. Um, there's quite a few things like that where they're trying to raise awareness of homeless people and make them be people as opposed to, you know, 
okay, this, there's these things and problems, right? Because like Linda said, they just want to feel human and they want to feel important, right? That somebody cares enough to, to chat with them for five minutes. Anything you guys want to add? Questions? Are we all hungry? Is it lunchtime? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have anything else right now. I'm good, I think. So I have a question for you, Eugene. Like being being a veterinarian, um, do you often want to photograph animals, or do you want to get out of there and get away from animals as soon as possible? <laughs> well, it depends on the animal that comes in the office. No, um, I, I, I've I've shot I've shot animals. Actually, I have. It's not on this computer. It's on my computer at home. I mean, I, I've I've done shoots of um, uh, some some owners with their animals and and of my pets too. Uh, Thankfully, they don't move as fast as birds do, so I can, you know, the focusing isn't as much of an issue. But um, the uh, actually one of our clinic cl nope, he's he's sleeping right now. But one of our cl clinic cats right now, he's 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 quite the photogenic guy. Um, oh, you know what? I wish I had those pictures. They're at, they're on my they're on my home computer though. Uh, he he's a retired show cat. He used to do a drum and a skateboard routine. And I do have some photos of that from his previous owner. And I wish I had those to show, but I do not have them. I'll have to get those out. We'll put them up on Google Plus and then and then tag us. I will absolutely. I will put those out there. Good. I I wouldn't have believed it if I if I didn't see it. And he, you know the, the previous owner, he gave them to she gave them to me because he you know he he retired, and I took I had to I had to get some photos of it, and I did, and I just couldn't believe what he was doing. He was doing the drums, and then he did. A skateboard for about a good 10, 15 feet before he fell off, but he he was doing pretty good. He fell off, but he, he was. Go oh, echo. Sorry about I'm that. Just gonna, oh, open. oh, was that me? No, I, I heard the echo going on to your. So you took out the headphones. Okay, I'm just gonna open my door, and I'm guessing there's probably. Yep, yeah. <laughs> I was right. Ah! Can you go outside the door for me? There you go. Yeah, she's pretty. Yeah, and this is the one-year-old or the two-year-old? This is a two-year-old. This is Mocha. Mocha? The well, first there, kitty. We adopted both of them from the same shelter. Mm -hmm. she, um, she had given birth to six kittens, and she was from one of the uh, one of the native reserves up north from from here. Okay. And um, another cat had given birth to another six kittens at the same time, and then the other cat uh, disappeared or got run over or something. We don't know what happened to the other mom, and so she adopted the other six kittens. So she was nursing twelve kittens at a time. Yeah, they were feeding her six cans of cat food a day to uh, just keep her nourished. Mm -hmm. But she's a great little kitty. All right. Well, I'm going to. Um, we're going to say goodbye. I'm going to end the recording, and if you guys want to stay on and keep chatting, you can feel free to do so. I'm just going to click goodbye. So we'll say goodbye to the recorded version. Thanks, Darlene. Thank you very much, Darlene. It was fun. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.